Thank you very much. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I noticed that not so many people on the list of participants uh, seem to be people in the world of Siegel Modular Forms, so I thought I'd give more of a survey talk to try to get more people interested in Siegel Modular Forms, and particularly Theta Series. Um, so, the title of the conference has geometric in it somewhere, so here's my little blurb on why this is geometry. We put a take my uh, Z lattice um, with a positive definite quadratic form, and I think about that as either capturing or imposing geometry on the lattice, depending on your point of view. Did that geometry already exist, or are you putting it there? All right. And of course, the way I try to sell to our funding agencies that this is geometry, is our quadratic form is capturing length of vectors, and the associated bilinear form, symmetric bilinear form, is capturing whether two vectors are orthogonal. Okay, so I'm interested in studying the structure on my lattice L by studying um, its sublattices and looking at them according to the geometry that they inherit from the big lattice L. And so here's my question. If I'm given an n-dimensional lattice lambda with a quadratic form Q prime, I want to know how many sublattices of L look like lambda. OK, and Siegel's generalized theta series allows us to look at this question. So what we do, um, for convenience, first of all, assume that L is even integral so that its values from the quadratic form are in the even integers. And I let capital Q be a gram matrix for my quadratic form relative to, let's get the buttons right, this basis for my lattice. Okay, so then I construct the theta series. Um, I'm gonna fix this degree n, and then I look at the theta series um, that people will call, some people will call genus n, but for me genus is about a, a quadratic form, so I call it Siegel degree. And here I'm just gonna sum over these m by n integral matrices, conjugate my gram matrix by that guy, and then I have a variable tau. This is an appropriate exponential, here it is here. It's the exponential pi i trace of my matrix. That's matrix trace. Um, I don't put the two into my exponential as a lot of people do because I put it into my quadratic form. And my tau is from Siegel upper half space, so it's mimicking the um, complex upper half plane. Uh, y is positive definite here, so that, that's it's symmetric. So as a quadratic form, it's positive definite, and that's for convergence of the theta series. So, how does this make sense for looking at quadratic forms? Well, I'm gonna think about U as a change of basis matrix. So if I take my basis, my given basis, X1 through Xm, and I multiply that by U, I get some other vectors, Y1 through Yn, that are all in my lattice L. And I can use them to build a sublattice. lattice um, There's a slight technicality that this might not be an internal direct sum, but it, uh, that's fine. It doesn't cause problems. And the quadratic form from L restricted to lambda is given by this conjugate of the gram matrix for L. And so as a Fourier series, this theta series has Fourier coefficients that are these representation numbers. This is just very naive, right? What's the What's this number going to be? It's just however many U's conjugate that ground matrix Q into the matrix T. Okay. So my question now, redescribed, is um, to try to figure out or understand these representation numbers, these Fourier coefficients of my theta series. Okay. So I claim that these Fourier coefficients really do capture 
how many sublattices of L have a given structure. So if I take any matrix T and let D be its rank, so any one of my symmetric positive definite matrices, um, with D, the rank of that matrix, I can find a change of basis matrix that will conjugate T into um, a block triangular, uh, sorry, block diagonal matrix whose upper entry T prime here is positive definite as a quadratic form. And then the number of these matrices U that are counted by the representation number, that Fourier co coefficient R of LT, the number of U's that conjugate the gram matrix for L into T actually corresponds in a sense with the number of smaller dimension U primes that conjugate Q into T prime. Those two representation numbers, representation number of T by L and the representation number of T prime by L are actually equal. If I divide by the order of the orthogonal group of T prime, I get exactly the number of sublattices lambda prime of L whose quadratic form is given by T prime, the quadratic form inherited from the quadratic form on L. Okay, now this theta series is a prototypical example of a Ziegel modular form, and Ziegel wanted to study these quadratic forms and their, um, their representation numbers. What does it mean to be a Ziegel modular form? Well, first of all, it's analytic in all the variables of tau, and it transforms under a complex, or, sorry, a congruent subgroup of the symplectic group. So this is just the natural extension of what we do for classical modular forms. I take all my matrices, I look at all the matrices in um, SPNZ, which are in SL2NZ, and what I need, right, to just be in the symplectic group are all these symmetric conditions, and that A transpose D minus B transpose C is the identity. And how do we get that my theta series is actually a modular form for a subgroup of SP and Z? Well, first of all, we have an inversion formula, and this is one of my favorite proofs. Um, you look at this for the the classical theta function, which I've written here. And the way we prove the inversion formula is we introduce a new variable. We do Fourier analysis or Poisson summation on the new variable, and then we set it equal to zero. I think that's just a lovely trick. And this ends up giving us a relation between the classical theta series at tau and um, at minus one over four tau. And so this is my homage to Poisson summation for the theta function. <laughs> okay. So this technique for proving an inversion formula extends for getting an inversion formula for my more generalized theta series. And we use that twice to get the transformation formula. Now actually in that previous formula for the classical theta function, the relation was between theta of tau and theta of minus one over four tau, it's really because this inversion formula is giving you a relation between the theta series on your lattice and the theta series on the dual lattice. Okay, so in proving the transformation formula, we use that twice and we get, um, should be right there, yes, good. We get this equation, but it's for these matrices that come out of, where's my dot? There it is. Come out of gamma naught of n, where n, my level, divides this block C. And what's n? It's the smallest positive integer so that n times Q inverse is even integral. Now remember, Q inverse is going to be the ground matrix for the quadratic form on our dual lattice. And so this level is measuring some, something like the distance. If you think about it locally, it makes more sense, I think. Um, it's measuring somehow the distance between L and its dual. Okay, so we get this nice transformation formula. This is um, a sort of obvious generalization if you were just to guess something to write down if you know transformation formula in the more classical case. Um, instead of just C tau plus D to a power, we have determinant of that, and our chi is 
a determinant of the block of the matrix. Chi here is a Dirichlet character modulo the level. We can describe it explicitly, it's a Legendre symbol. It's different depending on whether M is even or odd. And I want to avoid in this talk dealing with the square roots, which we can deal with, it's not a problem, it's just annoying when we take M to be odd. So I'm gonna take M to be even from now on and call it 2K. And then our Dirichlet character is just this Legendre symbol. Well, we make it the Kronecker symbol at two. And at P, what it's measuring for us is whether, our, so P not dividing the level, it's measuring whether our lattice locally is hyperbolic. And even at two, that's, it's the same thing, that because I've insisted my lattice is even integral, locally at two, there are only two possible structures when two does not divide the level. Okay, all right, so big deal, how does this help? All I've done is take this information that I want to understand and call it a Fourier coefficient. Okay, well we have HECA operators that act on our theta series, yay. So, to talk about these theta series, I want to back up and look at Siegel modular forms more generally. Integral weight still. And for every prime P, we've got n plus one HECA operators generating our local HECA algebra. N of them are algebraically independent. Um, there's a general construction. I don't like looking at double cosets in particular for doing computations. Um, so instead of looking at the double coset to construct each one of these HECA operators, uh, which I'll just for here call T, what I do is I sum over gamma these representatives for this uh, coset set, or coset space, and I have F slash delta inverse. Delta is determined by my choice of HECA operator, and I'll show you in a moment, before, but before cluttering my slide more, let me look at this. Um, so I follow delta inverse by this collection of gammas that are giving us representatives for that quotient. Um, how do I choose delta? Well, if I'm looking at the HECA operator T of P, I just take delta to be P times the identity matrix followed by the identity matrix on the diagonal there. So that's kind of the obvious generalization of what you would do from the classical case. And then we've got these tj of p squareds as well. I can take j going from one to n and look at these diagonal matrices. So they're kind of liftings of p, one over p that you might think of in the more classical case. Okay. Um, we can write any one of these t sub j of p squareds in terms of the rest of those HECA operators. That's how the algebraic relation goes, it's very explicit. So years ago, when I just started working on Siegel modular forms, um, I wanted to know what the HECA operators did and I got really frustrated looking at the literature because they don't tell me anything explicit enough. And so I got Jim Hafner to work with me because he's smart and he's patient with me. Um, and so we figured out um, how to get a set, an explicit set of matrix representatives to give us the action of the HEC operators so that I can actually do computations in my sense, which is, you know, pen and paper. I'm not fancy like a lot of you people here. So our set of representatives are parameterized by lattices, so we realized it was convenient to first rewrite our Fourier series instead of as series supported on matrices to write them as series supported on lattices. So we notice first of all that if we take any GLN Z matrix, G inverse transpose G is an element of the symplectic group and so it'll also be in any one of those congruent subgroups since it has zero as a block there. And so the, the relation on our our Siegel modular form gives us that f of tau times chi of determinant of g is f of this conjugate of tau by g inverse times the determinant of g to the k. 
And so if I do a change of variables, I rewrite f as its Fourier series supported on matrices, and then I do a change of variables, I get this new relation that the coefficient of f on t is related to the coefficient on, of f on t conjugated by g transpose. They're equal if chi of minus one is the same as minus one to the k. But that doesn't have to happen, and so if it doesn't happen that those guys are equal, then I, I just put an orientation on each of my lattice representatives. So for each isometry class of a lattice, I'll have two copies, one with each orientation. Okay, not harmful at all in, in doing my computations. So then I can write my, my Siegel modular form as supported on these isometry classes of lattices. Now my exponential, so I have just shorthand, what's my exponential gonna do? Well, this is representing the sum over all those conjugates of T, where T is a matrix for the quadratic form on my lattice, lambda. And depending on whether I had to put an orientation on that lattice or not, changes what G runs over. If I don't need an orientation, then I just have G run over GLN said modulo the orthogonal group of T or of the lambda sub T um, so that I don't repeat the gram matrices giving the quadratic form on lambda. And if I have an orientation, then I just run over SLNZ modulo the O plus, which are the intersection of the orthogonal group with SLNZ. Okay, groovy. So then we finally prove our theorem. Stuff in gray is what I don't want you to stress about. Um, so we found that the lambda coefficient of f slash t of p is given by the sum, where I'm gonna sum over omega running between p lambda and lambda. I get chi of p to a power, very explicit in terms of the invariant factors of omega and lambda. Power of p, again, very explicit. And then the coefficient of f on lambda scaled by one over p. So, sorry, on omega scaled by one over p. And all these omegas in the sum have to be, uh, when scaled by one over p, they have to be even integral. The other way of capturing this is that our Fourier coefficient on anyone who's not even integral is zero. We could just define that. Okay. So we can do the same sort of thing for looking at tj of p squared on the Fourier coefficients, um, but we encounter an incomplete character sum. Okay, so we're number theorists. We're not afraid of incomplete character sums. We know how to evaluate them, but if we can replace them with a complete character sum, why not? That's prettier. So what we did is we just smoothed these HECA operators so that what we get, our TJ tildes, they generate the same local algebra. So we just smooth them so that we can complete our character sums, and here in the, the sum defining TJ tilde, this beta guy is just a very friendly little operator. It's the number of r-dimensional subspaces of an m-dimensional space over z mod p. And yes, as I said, these guys generate the same Hecke algebra as the TJs, but now we've got a nicer formula for their action on the Fourier coefficients of our Siegel modular form. We get, now we're gonna sum over omegas lying between P lambda and one over P lambda. We get chi of a power of P, P to a power, and the coefficient of F on omega, except now we've got this extra thing that comes from our character sum. And what it measures is something about, as Jim liked to describe it, it gives us some geometric information about omega and lambda. Um, it's about the part where they overlap with um, invariant factors of one. And so it's measuring totally isotropic co-dimension n minus j subspaces of that piece. The total, we got the totally isotropic because we completed the character sums. Okay. Now, how does this help us understand theta series? Um, well, 
right, I'm not wearing my spectacles, so I got a little scared there. Yes, we're P not dividing the level. I'm gonna directly apply these matrices to my theta series. Um, I don't expect to get a nice result if I take P dividing the level. It doesn't happen classically. I'm not gonna expect it happens in, more, in a more generalized situation. So I'm gonna look here at one of the trickier ones, T sub J of P squared, sorry, T sub J tilde. So I just apply my matrices that represent my HECA operator directly to my theta series and I get this kind of sum, my theta series is a sum over these lambdas in L, and then my inner sum is over these omegas sitting between P lambda and one over P lambda, which are all integral. And then I just do another favorite mathematician trick because I uh, reverse the order of summation. And now what I'm looking at are these omegas lying in one over P L, and lambda lies between P omega and this guy delta, who's just the intersection of one over P omega and L. Okay. So now to figure out, let me go back. What I want to do is I want to evaluate this inner sum and I want to do it really explicitly. So I'm gonna construct all of these lambdas now the lambda lies between one over P omega and P omega. So a priori, you thought, well, might have to work mod P squared and that, that's not so fun because mod P squared, I don't get to use all this nice quadratic forms theory. So what I do is I fix one of my omegas that's in my, now my outer sum and I decompose it in terms of how it looks sitting inside of L. So I decompose it as this one over P omega naught plus omega one plus P omega two, where omega naught, omega one are what I call primitive in L. So if I intersect them with P L, I get P times them. Okay. So then I'm gonna use a two-step mod P construction to construct all of these Ls, and I'm gonna count how many ways I'm constructing something, and I'm gonna count that, that quantity that's captured by that, that guy called, that I called alpha, that's capturing that geometric information. Um, I need to keep track of the invariant factors of omega in lambda and this alpha guy. So step one, so in my boxes, I'm always reminding you of stuff from previous slides. So, in step one, I first work with delta mod P delta, and I'm gonna look at the image of omega naught plus omega one, and I can capture that information from global information, and otherwise that's illegal for me to say I can use. So that's captured by looking at the image of omega intersect delta. So I extend that by this guy, delta two, and how I do that, well, it's just gonna depend on J and what I want the invariant factors of lambda and omega to be. So that's not a hard count. And now I take delta prime to be the pre-image of that guy in delta. And now I work in delta prime mod P. So again, I'm working with a quadratic form over a finite field. So life is good. And now I extend the image of omega naught to this the image of what will be lambda, and I do that in several steps so that I can be counting, but it's not that hard. I'll get the steps in order to count correctly and not overcount. Um, but it's all just using the theory of quadratic forms over finite fields. Okay, and so in the end, I get this, uh, this description of the image of my theta series under this Hecke operator. And it's got this coefficient here in green, and it's explicitly described by a double sum. Okay, it doesn't really seem like I've done anything except make myself do a lot of work. But now I compare that to the sum of theta series attached to these neighbor lattices, P to the J neighbors, I call them. Um, so those guys are gonna be in the same genus as L. They're gonna have invariant factors of J P's, J one over P's and the rest ones. 
Okay, and so I'm restricted here. J has to be less than or equal to K for this to work. And actually J has to be less than K of chi of P is minus one. In other words, if L mod P is not hyperbolic, I won't be able to construct any guys meeting these conditions. Okay, so I construct all of those K sub J's and I count how many times one of these lattices omega and one over P, that's integral, actually even integral. I count all of those guys and I get some coefficient that's actually not too horrible looking. And now I wanna compare. And I'm hoping I get the same thing because in the classical case, if I were working in uh, Siegel degree one, that would be true. Okay, well, it starts off being true. If I look at a KJ, or sorry, I look at an omega who's in one of these KJs, but not in any of those KJ minus I's, with I positive, then my coefficients on both sides here match up. So my coefficient, oops, ah, very much wrong button. Um, so my coefficient there and my coefficient there, they match up. But that's not the case when I look at these other omegas that are in my sum. And so what I have to do is a balancing act. And that's what I have here. So box. See, that's, that doesn't look so bad. I'm gonna make another set of generators for my local HECA algebra. Um, these guys, u sub i, they're not so bad, you know, a little power of minus one, a p, and my friendly operator there. And then these guys are friendly things too. They're not so scary. And now I have this other thing that I need to do my balancing because this is what I get. If I replace my HECA operator T sub J tilde with this guy T sub J prime, which involves these friendly guys U sub I, then the image of my theta series is the sum over these P to the J minus I neighbors as I varies from zero to J. Okay, so I'm still not where I want to be. That previous equation, I can even go back, this in the lower box, that's essentially a generalization of what's often called the Eichler commutation relation. Um, and what I don't, never found in, in Eichler's papers is, well, you, if you go ahead and average that Eichler commutation relation, then you get an eigenform for, uh, of the average or genus theta series. Okay, so how am I gonna do that? Well, I've got the sum and I've got the Ks on the one side, and so I'm gonna sort them. I'm gonna sort them into isometry classes, and then I'm gonna count. Okay, so the number of times one of these Ks appears is one of these P to the, let's say P to the L neighbors of L. Well, it's the number of isometries that take K into the right place with the right invariant factors, uh, but I'll have repetition. So I have to divide by the order of the orthogonal group of K. Um, and now I want to average over the isometry classes in the genus of L. Okay, so I've replaced my term that was counting the, uh, having sorted the Ks into isometry classes. And in my formula for the image of the theta series, I had the theta series attached to these guys' Ks, which is why it's appearing over there. And now here, I'm reflecting that I'm gonna average over the isometry classes in the genus of L. I weight each isometry class by one over the order of its orthogonal group which makes sense if you think about it. So you're talk, thinking about you know, how dense are these in the general vector space, general quadratic space. Okay, I again switch my order of summation. Um, I rearrange just how I'm writing these conditions to put L prime in the middle. And I've switched where I'm putting these orders of orthogonal groups. And now, it's not hard to evaluate that inner sum. Again, I'm just gonna be looking at K mod PK, but looking locally, it's the same as looking at L mod PL. And then I'm just counting. I'm counting things 
counting hyperbolic space, totally, uh, totally isotropic spaces in a quadratic space over a finite field. That's not hard. So finally, I get my eigenform relation that says my average theta series, where here you can see I've averaged over the isometry classes in the genus of L, and my average theta series is an eigenform for these adjusted HECA operators, TJ primes, and here are my eigenvalues. Power of P, not so bad. My friendly guy, beta. And now what I have are things that should look kind of familiar to people who've ever worked with theta series or Eisenstein series in degree one. This is an eigenform we see for the classical theta function, uh, theta series. Um, when chi of p is one, and this, when chi of p is minus one, and you use tj, sorry, t of p squared. Okay, so those look nice, and what that does is it gives us explicit relations among our Fourier coefficients. So I'm putting together my formula for the action of the HEC operators on Fourier coefficients, and what I just got. Um, but it's very complicated. And so you can't just, I, I don't believe, you can just use this relation and some values of your Fourier coefficients to generate formulas for all your Fourier coefficients. Jim and I did it in degree two, but we could still only do it over an, an averaged Fourier coefficient. Okay. So, this formula up there had the restriction where j had to be less than or equal to k. And here in this theorem, I have the, the complementary j's. What happens to them when I can't construct these p to the j neighbors? Well, it turns out I get zero. So that made me happy because the same adjusted HECA operator worked to give me that. So that also gives me some relations on these Fourier coefficients. Again, I don't know how to extract a lot of information out of that. Okay. But there's more. And see, I'm going to finish early, as promised. All right. Well, Siegel already knew that the average theta series lies in the space of Siegel-Eisenstein series. So... These will be Siegel-Eisenstein series of the same level and character as the theta series, of course. How do we define them? Well, I'm first going to define the stabilizer at infinity, gamma infinity, to be a set of symplectic matrices, lower left block being zero. And the idea is that for every element in this double quotient, SVNZ quotient on this side by gamma infinity, this side by gamma naught of n, Every one of those guys has a Siegel-Eisenstein series attached to it. So some people will call these, in that double quotient, they'll call them the zero-dimensional cusps. Um, so what I want to do is take an element out of S, P, and Z. I'm going to look at its gamma naught of, well, the gamma naught n orbit of gamma infinity times my representative little gamma. Write that as a union, a disjoint union, using matrices delta so that I have a union of gamma infinity, little gamma, little delta. Put those into an Eisenstein series, so I sum over the deltas. I'm putting in this conjugate of the character to force this guy to transform with that character. And I have one of tau slash gamma delta, where one of tau slash a matrix ABCD means I'm looking at determinant to C tau plus D to the minus K. Okay. So in this way, I'm thinking, I'm going to force this guy to transform with character chi, weight k, under gamma naught of n, but there's a problem. That sum might not be well defined. And that took me a long time to, to sort out properly, um, most because it made me mad, so I was fighting it. So what do we do? Well, we do what Don Zaghi would tell us to do. We oversum. And by oversumming, everything is well-defined. And what we find is that when the initial sum that I wrote down is not well-defined, the oversum gives us zero, which means there is no Siegel-Eisenstein series associated to that cusp. And we see this when we look at gamma naught of four in the classical case, right? 
the fundamental domain has three cusps, but the space of Eisenstein series has dimension two. Okay, so what else can we say? Right, when my level N is square free, life is a little bit easier, I can associate each gamma naught of n orbit, so I've got one Ziegel Eisenstein series for each of these gamma naught of n orbits within the symplectic group. Um, I can associate each one of these orbits with a multiplicative partitioning of my level n. Um, and I'm not going to go deeply into that. So for a prime q dividing my component ND, well, that means that I've got a, a matrix representing this orbit that has order D at that prime. Okay, rank D. Um, okay, so what we get in this case is that when I look at just the HECA operators T of Q, Q dividing the level, acting on my Eisenstein series, I have an eigenform, and for the TQ of TJ of Q squared also, and the eigenvalues here in absolute value, there are some characters here, it's explicit, but that doesn't matter right now. So these eigenvalues are just harmless power of Q, but what you get is multiplicity one, just by looking at the T of Qs acting on this basis of Eisenstein, Siegel Eisenstein series. Okay. And for arbitrary level, so including square free level, I computed the action of the HECA operators, all the HECA operators on the basis of Eisenstein series, Siegel Eisenstein series. Pardon? Um, integral and half integral. Does that make sense? Wait. Yeah, okay. Pardon? Oh, sorry, sorry, good point, good point. No, for the way I'm defining the, I, sorry, I should have put this in there. Yeah, the way I'm defining the Eisenstein series, I need K to be greater than N plus one, else I won't have convergence. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So now I want to look more generally. Um, did I skip? No, that's fine. What I now want to do is try to realize my average theta series explicitly in terms of these Eisenstein series. Um, knowing how the Eisenstein series behave under the Hecke operators isn't so much help as it turns out. And the hardest part of all of this is to find a set of representatives for these cusps. Um, so you guys aren't afraid of quadratic forms, so this shouldn't be so terrible to look at. I can find a representative of each one of my elements in the double quotient that looks like this, identity zero M times the identity, where M is of course symmetric. And I'm gonna set H to be hyperbolic plane, A to be an anisotropic plane. And now I wanna describe what I'm calling a reduced representative. And for Q odd, I'm gonna say I've got a reduced representative here if M is congruent to this Jordan decomposition. Um, this is modulo a high enough power of Q. Oops, says it there, sorry about that typo. And each one of these Jordan components is DJ by DJ, just for some notation. And then I have some technical things. For most of these Jordan components, I can insist that they look like a bunch of ones, so diagonal form, a bunch of ones, and either one or some fixed non-square that I have. Yes. Um, at the extreme ends there or there, I might have to allow something more under conditions. Okay, that's not so bad to work with. Don't have to worry about much except that it's really explicit. 
Now at two, that's not so fun. If I'm looking at degree one, then it's not bad. I can describe exactly what's a complete set of reduced representatives so that I've got no repetition of the orbits, the gamma naught of n orbits. If two or four is the highest power of two that divides my level, then I'm still okay. But if eight divides my level, I can describe a set of representatives that include a complete set of representatives, but I'll have redundancy. And because the two-adic theory of quadratic forms is so painful, I didn't do any better. I, I spent a while on it, and then I just thought, oh, God, I hate my life. Um, so if someone really likes the two-adic theory of quadratic forms, have at it, please. OK, so then I extend this local definition of what's a reduced representative modulo power of a prime to a global definition, la, la. Um, there, I'm confessing. Um, yeah, so there's the weakness that I just told you about. OK. But we know some more about our Eisenstein series as well. I can figure out what they are at the cusps. So if I take my Eisenstein series and I hit it with um, the inverse of some matrix that doesn't come from its, the orbit it's supported on, and I take that limit as tau goes to I infinity, then I get zero. And if I take if I hit it with someone who's in the orbit, or the inverse of someone who's in its gamma naught of n orbit, then I get something non-zero. Yeah, the result's a little bit different if the level is two. OK. So then what I'm going to do is just evaluate my average theta series at the cusps and figure out how to match that up with the Eisenstein series. And this involves evaluating generalized Gauss sums, which ends up not being so hard and being kind of fun, and then, yay, I like my life again. And so this is my last theorem. Um, I take my generalized, or sorry, my average generalized Ziegel theta series, and I can write it explicitly here as a sum of Siegel-Eisenstein series. So this M is going to vary, so I'm varying over a complete set of reduced representatives. Um, my coefficient here, well, it factors as product of primes. That's what I'm doing right there. And I can describe each one of these local factors. Often I'll just get one times the power of my prime. And otherwise, I get a power of the prime times a, a generalized Gauss sum. But it's not such a bad Gauss sum. It's only modulo Q. And they're easy to describe. Did I do it? Yes. Yay. So one of these guys that appears here will just reduce to be these Legendre symbols um, times a classical Gauss sum to a power. Now, another weakness in all of this is that, except for n equals 1, and so very few cases for a level bigger than 1 and Siegel degree bigger than 1, we don't have Fourier expansions for the Eisenstein series. So the way I evaluated the action on them was not by knowing anything about Fourier coefficients. So. In the case of Siegel degree one, we do have really nice Fourier coefficients for all our Eisenstein series, so we could get explicit formulas for our represent average representation numbers out of this. Um, for degree two, trivial character, square-free level, we've got explicit formulas for the Fourier coefficients. Otherwise, for arbitrary Siegel degree, we've got the Fourier coefficients for one Eisenstein series, the one of level one. And those formulas aren't very pretty either. There are various versions of them, but they're kind of awkward to work with. But you could still get explicit formulas. Um, but that's it. 